it's also going, and then we just sink this shit. That's it. Oh, that was easy. That's it, that's how it goes. Well, so I've lined into this one. So our audio is just piping right to this one. Okay. And we just sync the audio and we're done. Well done. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> do you do these a lot? You sit and talk, or do you do this mostly? Uh, I do over a lot Skype. of yeah, a lot of over Skype. So the yeah. in-person thing is independently. Is it's nice. It's, it's nice. nice. Um, I've done a few podcasts and yeah. interview kind of stuff, but this is it's a nice little like radio booth kind of setup. You That's the here. idea. Is yeah. I want to be comfortable and I want to be able to just do it whenever I want. So this was more of a. A, like yeah. you sit down and get to actually have a conversation with someone kind of vibe this is more me i think than doing it like parasocially or doing it like over web stuff i think you yeah. capture something a little bit different well this is great thanks man yeah. i appreciate yeah. it well thanks for coming in and hey for everybody this cold opening with us uh this is inside tabletop and i'm here with brent hey i'm brent hey i i originally before you and i met i think you and i met like two or three adepticons ago probably pre-pandemic Possibly. No, I haven't been to Adepticon, but I wasn't at Adepticon before, before the pandemic. pandemic. I, okay. I think we might have met just five months ago, six months ago. No, we at definitely this met. Year's Adepticon. Really? We, How many Adepticons have you been to? Two. Okay, two. then, I then was yeah. At both of the kind of post pandemic, post -pandemic ones. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then, yes. Then before that, you were the canoe guy. That yep. was, the, in my head, that was, that was who you were. And that was your kind of like watershed moment. <laughs> I think like was that like your big first the the big break was batch painting a hundred goblins okay yeah okay so uh the channel was cruising along as yeah. typical small channels do and then I hit a video that resonated and the views went up and up and up every day for about a week oh wow and so that's the only viral video that I've ever had in the sense that the views increase really? day after day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so normally the experience for a YouTuber is you drop a video, your audience comes and watches you on the first day, and then it tapers off after that. Got it. And that is the only time when the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth day were just higher and higher and higher. Just got bigger um, and bigger and bigger. Yeah, and that's because I was starting from a small place, uh, but also, yes, the Batch painting 100 goblins video is is what got the channel That's started. That's your watershed, eh? Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Interesting. I, I, I think, uh, for those of you who don't know you, uh, Brent, obviously you are the Goober Town Hobbies. Yeah. Yeah. You're known for your paint work, and you're primarily like a web creator for like uh, the art of miniature painting, yes. I would say. That's, yep. that's like your cool focus. Cool. So on uh, this show, what we like to do is explore where people's hobbies came from, uh, where they kind of like grew and developed, and where they are today. Sure. So... How did you like this is a this is a weird hobby. Not everybody paints toy soldiers like for fun. Right. It's the hardest way to have a leisure activity for the most part. You not only do you play a game maybe, but you make it too at the same time. So it's fairly it's fairly like um I guess lots of people try it, not a lot of people stick with it. So for what sure. was your like introduction to this? Where did you discover right. this kind of stuff? So my nerd origins were Star Wars customizable card game. Okay. Yeah. So the this FFG is, one? Was it FFG? Final, Final no, Fantasy this Flight? was Decipher. Decipher. Okay. Yep. Oh, the one that got canceled. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think there have been three or four now. I think we're on the fourth the 90s one, one because this is the 90s got one. Got it. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yep. There's a comedian named Jeff May who is a huge fan of that game. Ah. And I watched one of his shows called... Um, Oh, what's it called? I Must Break You, where he breaks packs. Like, he breaks packs of cards, and he finds old packs of that game and, like, breaks them open, and it's incredibly so satisfying. Yeah. So good. And there used to be a smell to it, too. For real? Packs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so, a whole something experience. Something about the printer, the ink, yeah. or whatever. It's just very nostalgic. And actually, at Gen Con a year ago, I found a seller selling old packs. I was very excited. Like, one, the, the experience of breaking open a pack is always dopamine. Sure, whatever. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Addiction. The unknown, the unknown, like uh -huh. satisfaction of like getting something cool. Yep, it's the slot machine, but also I, I kind of remembered there's a smell to this. This is going to be so much fun. Yeah, full open, sensory experience. I open, well, I open it up and it's like, oh, this was stored in a smoker's home for 20 years. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> oh wow. Okay. Um, but yeah, so as a I don't know, 10, 11 year old, something like that, I got into the Star Wars game. I think it was actually a Christmas present from my parents, but. We got the, the local school children playing that. So that was the nerd origins. Um, my family moved to a different town when I was mm -hmm. about 12 years old and could not find any kids in that town to play SWCCG with. The kids in that town are playing Warhammer. 
So I got drafted in. Somebody had to play Dark Eldar, so I was playing Dark Eldar. Right. Uh, put in. Put this in. This is my third edition there. 40k. This yep. is the Black Templars Dark Eldar starter set. Exactly. Introduction of Black Eldar. Okay. Exactly. Cool. Exactly. Yep. So I was playing Dark Eldar, and then the kids wanted to play Fantasy, and then I got to choose Orcs and Goblins, the Green Skins, and so yeah, middle school, high school, I was uh, painting Warhammer, playing Warhammer, uh, did the typical thing uh, or. The very common thing of in the twenties or so, kind you of lapsed. Yeah, lapsed. Yeah. Went yeah, to do other common. things, and then around age thirty, I, I came back, and I've been in it ever since. Mm -hmm. um, since then, my uh, it, tastes have have changed. I've been trying out miniatures from all kinds of other companies because now sure. there yeah. are all kinds of other companies. They're, they're more above water, I would say. Sure. Right. So, like before, yeah. I think the the difference was. In a in a small retail environment where you're bringing you're risking your livelihood bringing something in, Games Workshop was the one that seemed to know what they were doing because they had a trade team and they would right. teach you how to sell their product and they had everything in one spot. So these smaller miniature games they existed back then, but they were very much like the iceberg below water, right? Like you couldn't yeah. they couldn't get their head into a real space retail store. Um, and you've come back, I think, at like the greatest time ever because social media and the internet and like that ability to, I think, like Agreed. network and show off your art, your art basically right. has allowed you to like be able right. to be way more choosy. You're, you're able to go to the restaurant and order nothing but appetizers now if you want. Sure are. Cool. Yeah. 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 So you had your Stranger Things moment. You were the new guy in town and found a new crew of people that liked the similar stuff to you and got into Warhammer. Yeah. Um, what was your first model? What was the first thing you ever painted and how did that go? Because you're a painting guy now, so I want to hear the story of like your first paint job. Yeah, so it was uh, Dark Eldar Warrior. Um, actually, to be fair, I think the very first one was a Dark Eldar Reaver jet bike. Okay. Um, but I stripped that one, unfortunately. But like later that same day, I painted some Dark Eldar Warriors. Cool. So, so it... We can count it either. We can count, yeah, either one. <laughs> uh, because I do have the, the Dark Eldar Warriors that I picked back then. Okay. No, no primer, uh, scab red armor, because they were out of blood red or gore red that day. I forget. Right. Yeah, so that was, notoriously did not cover very well, that cover either. Red gore covered better, but okay. scab red was a terrible cut. Like, it wouldn't okay. go over black. It wouldn't go over anything. So it was streaky, very thin yeah. paint. That's, that's unfortunate. Yeah. But it was the... Hexagon pots with the black screw lid is the, mm, is the area. They would dry about. out. They instantly. would. They would. But they had a good smell to them too. You know. <laughs> they did, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent flavors. They gave them mm -hmm. good flavors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. But that was scab red, which was one shade darker than sure. the recommended gore red. Mm -hmm. uh, mithril silver helmets, red eyes, no primer, and then goblin green bases. I learned later how to glue rocks onto it and put more goblin yep. green on the rocks. Uh, a couple weeks later, I learned about black ink and was able to slather black ink on things. That was a big day. I was okay. pretty happy about that. Um, and then all, over on the orcs and goblins side, man, I made an innovation when I mixed green ink with black ink. I made my own black green orc skin ink juice for for making them look good. That's cool. But, uh, yeah, that's the that's the sort of thing. So how that, that feel? Like how that feel the first time you did it? Like what was the? Really what was, okay, so like because you came from like a CCG place yep. where your imagination is like, how do I mix and match and combine these things into my story or my? Because my understanding was there was like battlegrounds in that game. You had characters, you had equipment, and you almost like built like your sort of team, if you will, and where they were going to operate to try and win yep. that game. So you were kind of extroverting that idea into. A collection already. Yeah. What was that like transition like in a collection? Like expressing yourself that way. Like how did that feel painting those? And so there's there is that element of collection for sure. Yeah. Um, collecting the weird little niche things, organizing them into teams, figuring out what you're going to take in your list or your deck or whatever it is. Um, at the time, I don't know if this is quite related, but I was also really into color coding things. Cool. So, so the, the organization of, I, I'm not just going to have only gore red soldiers. The first squad's going to be gore red. Right. Next squad's going to be midnight blue. Then we're going to have lich purple. And I never made it to dark angels green, but it was going to be, each squad is going to be color coded. Same mithril silver helmets, same right. goblin green bases, but... Um, very much into the idea of, yeah, this is a, this is a group of 12 soldiers. They go together and, 
Yeah, very, very much into the, the, like the scheming of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kinda, it a, felt like satisfying. That's, that's awesome. That's kind of like reorganizing your your deck list, reorganizing your binder, that sort of stuff. I think. Cool. That's yeah. awesome. So, so how did you become? So obviously, you lapsed at some point. Sure. Did you get to what you feel as like a competent painting level back then? Like, I'd, so in your teenage years, like you like felt like, yeah, this looks like the book. Like, how did that? How did that go? That yes. process at the time. At the time, absolutely, I thought I was one of the better painters in my friend group. Cool. For sure, for sure. And there was definitely the experience of wanting to go to game day to show my friends what I'd been painting. Wow, okay. Yeah, and that was that was a big part of the hobby for me, and I think it still is. Um, so it's something that took me a while to realize because, like I said, I came in it through the game side of things, but as time went along, I realized that my favorite part of a lot of these games is the setup mm -hmm. and seeing all of the models painted on the battlefield 100%. in context. That moment of presentation yeah. when you, right. when, it's like you've cooked yeah. a really good dinner and you've just gotten to put it on the table. Right. That, that satisfying feeling of like, I made this and now I can like hear the drums and I can, you know what I mean? Like that yeah. moment of like presentation. That's really funny. That the game night was like a motivator for you because that was a real, um, I think uh, observation I had that you always had people who would come to the game night and they're, they're sort of like their, their thing was I'm going to test myself against another person and then I'm going to go back and I'm going to tweak my army list. And that was their motivator. But for some people it was, I'm going to find out what I get to paint next. And it was, it was that idea of like, you come down to the game night and you would play a game and you go, Oh, you know what? I played against so-and-so and he had this thing that, well, I, I didn't have really an answer for that's the thing I'm going to buy next and I'm going to take that home to paint it. And then lo and behold, the next week they'd show up and that was like what they'd worked on all week and get done for like that game night. Was that, yeah. was that like really the, the I th feeling? I think so. Yeah. I mean, I very clearly remember always knowing when the next day, game day was yeah. and knowing what I wanted to paint before then and being very excited to get these witches done so that I could bring them to game day cool. or, or whatever it was. That was a weird year of Dark Eldar too because they all had a very like, they're all wearing like weird like David Lynch Harkonnen outfits. Like they all mm -hmm. had like, like sort of weird kink kind of like stylings to them. They were right. very strange, yeah. It, it's very strange stuff and looking back at it like, the models are not great, and and if I yeah. were to come to it fresh, I would not have picked those. Yeah, they're a mixed but, bag. They like yeah. two or three sculptors. The the Fitzpatrick stuff's really nice, like yep. the witches, yep. the incubi. They're quite nice. I think one of the two archons was by Fitzpatrick too, and then the rest of it I think is like Gary Morley. So you have like the guy who sculpted Blood yeah. Bowl sculpting elves. <laughs> it's just yeah. not great. <laughs> so it's it's fun to meet Fitz at conventions. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, war gods of, uh, Egyptus, Olympus, yeah, Egyptus. Olympus, yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah, it's his company. Yeah. Crocodile you can, games. Crocodile games. You can really, you can really see the, the, the influence that that early sculpting in the dark elder stuff, especially had with like his yeah. Bastet stuff and like all of the, like sort of like more almost feline featured hmm. stuff that he has, has that like pointed ears. It's very similar to like his old witches and stuff is like witches from Warhammer, um, fantasy battle and stuff too. Well, that's really cool. So then you lapse from ages, what to what roughly like, Oh, after university years. Yeah. University years, um, um, is is the big lapse. I remember sophomore year, I did bring, bring some savage orcs with me and I had like a, a secret drawer in my desk. Yeah? Yeah, so like uh, friends come knocking like, time to go out party, like, <laughs> just a minute, just a minute. Like, just gotta minute. put some pants on. <laughs> yeah. You're putting away your dark elves, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but no, most, mostly lapsed, uh, yeah, right. uni university years and so on. White Dwarf was what kept in it for me. Because yeah. I always, so my parents would buy me anything that I could read. Like, you know, I'm like your kid goes to the toy store and they would beg for like a toy or whatever. I wouldn't get models. I would, if I, if there was a book or reading involved, my parents had this great rule where like, whatever, go for it. You can have anything you want that you want to read. So like white dwarf was like a big thing for them. Cause it was my monthly subscription of a thing that I always read like cover to cover. So even through like my high school years and my early university years, I was still getting white dwarf magazine okay. and that kind of like, and this is all pre-internet. So that's, that's that parasocial connection where you feel like you're connected to this mm -hmm. group of guys in Nottingham who all yeah. play Warhammer together, who you're yeah. watching them play a game and you're learning to paint from them. Or you're hearing what's new and exciting. And like back then, mid nineties, late nineties, they're publishing games in the magazine too. So yeah. like I played Mordheim a year and a half before it came out. Cause it was published over four issues of white dwarf. Same with battlefleet Gothic. You got the full rules for battlefleet Gothic in white dwarf over like two or three issues. So like, you, you would very often be be like, I'm going to convert up a Mordheim Warband. And then like, 
use whatever fancy plastics at the time and already have your warband done when the box game launched that October for like the Christmas release schedule or whatever. Um, but that was it for me. It was White Dwarf. It was that was like my parasocial, like I guess, like IV drip, like you had at that game night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, that's that's dead and gone now because the internet is that for everybody. Yeah, you can lapse. You could lapse out of the hobby probably, not touch a brush, not touch a miniature for like five years. But because your social media is showing you like wargaming stuff, you're still somehow connected to it. Yeah. Like, I don't think, I don't think it'd be possible to fully la like without going and like manually unliking all your favorite companies. I don't think it'd be possible for me to actually lapse from the hobby today. That's a good point. You know what I mean? Like I'm yeah. having the marketing like shoved into my eye holes every time I'm going to the bathroom, right? Like, you know what I mean? Or like, I'm like just randomly doom scrolling on my phone. Like it's, it's kind of like, it's not really possible not to have some inkling of like what's going on and what's new. Yeah. That's a good point. I mean, I remember university years, pretty much once a year, like go home for Christmas break kind of thing, meet up with my old high school friends, go to the game store. So yeah. like, it was like something to do with my friends, my old high school friends was to go to the ancestral game store and, and see what was there. Mm. And I remember being like, oh, they actually redid the, uh, the Wood Elves. You know, yeah. Something like that. And then not think about it again for years. So. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Right. You could, you could Fun. detach basically back then. Yeah. You could yeah, kind yeah. of like walk away from it and have it and have something else consume your interest. You know what I mean? You become excited about something else and have that take over like your, 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 what you're choosing to interact with. But these days, I think if you have a hobby, you're going to see that hobby everywhere. It was funny because yeah. earlier we were joking. I was like, no, REI, I don't need to buy it. It's because I'm on REI's mailing list from years Forever. backpacking and, you know, like shopping at REI all across the United States, but I don't live in the United States anymore. So I still get these like random social media posts or email or whatever of what the co-op members can do today. Cause I had this hobby, you know what I mean? I still have the hobby, but where I was, it was like targeted to me, like how I could interact with it. And it's, it's going to keep happening forever unless I go and I'm too lazy to unsubscribe from all those mailing lists. Understood. <laughs> so, so then you lapse, what brings you back? What gets you back into it? So it was actually at the gym. Um, the, the guy who was helping me squat. So I was doing like a morning strength building gym class sure. and it was like me and the gym owner just hanging out there alone. Like, how was your weekend? How was your weekend? And Dirk, the gym owner, did a, a brave and outstanding thing. He said, I had a great weekend. I was painting my toy soldiers. Nice. And it, just in that context, I mean, maybe he knew me and like figured he could take that sure, risk. Yeah, that yeah, social yeah, risk. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I said, oh, tell me more. Yeah. And yeah, he was painting, I don't know, something for... Horus Heresy. I don't know what it was. It doesn't matter. The, the but he was telling me that yeah, he's hmm. he's still into Warhammer, and he was one of my the, the people I hung out with back then. And he's like, yeah, if you if you have some stuff, come on over. And so I I dug the Dark Eldar out of storage, yeah. and uh, was playing a handful of games, the seventh edition. Sure. And uh, I've been back since. Basically. That's really interesting. Yeah, it's funny how that can happen. I think this is one of those hobbies where you can make a. Uh, almost like I tell the story actually in a couple of these podcasts before, but you can make like a, 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 a strangely dog whistly connection with somebody that they happen to also have that hobby with you. Like yeah. I was talking with one of my guests about Warhammer tattoos. Like if you have a Warhammer tattoo, it's almost like a dog whistle for, mm. Oh, you're safe to talk to this about, or like you won't, like I won't have to explain this to you. Like, right. I don't actually think it's that weird to have interests like that anymore because I think there's no. interests that, that are popularized by things like social media, like travel is way more glamorous than it used to be. It used to be like yeah. the dirty backpackers. You know what I mean? Like it wasn't actually like a travel wasn't cool until social media made it cool. Like there's things that like become cool over time. Like D and D's become cool all of a sudden because yep. you know, you've got um, the, uh, the big bang theory basically telling you, yeah, you can have a, pretty girl from next door still love you if you play D&D &D. like all these things have kind of like mainstreamed these ideas but I find that those like weird dog whistly connections where it's like you've got a tattoo or you're wearing a shirt you know what I mean that has like a, a game reference on it or something like that can like strike up those conversations now yeah. that's cool that you took that maybe you just looked like you knew what Warhammer was and he, and he yeah, you can probably make that yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, but no there was there was no yeah, there wasn't too much bashfulness about it. Sure, like, yeah, it yeah. It was just like this is this is what I did this weekend. It was a little bit like, oh, what were you painting? There was just I there was a hint of bashfulness right. there. Yeah, just yeah. A hint. But uh, he he came out with it, and mm -hmm. like, oh yeah, I, I I know that stuff. Let me let me go see what I've got. That's so great. Um, and 
yeah, I've, I've been back into it since. Like with the with the whole nerd culture growing or whatever. Um, yeah, it's wild to think about that having interests used to be frowned upon. Yeah. If you have an interest other than watching reality TV and sports, like those are grilling reality TV and sports sure. are like, yeah. used to be the accepted. Well, that being social was anything where you congregated and were social were like the accepted activities. Okay. And then yeah. cause that seems to, if you, if you take like that, like 1950s, like, let's say like, um, mentality on what a, a good hobby yeah. is. It'd be like, oh, you can fish because you go with your buddies and you go fish or you can, and that lets you provide, you know what I mean? As a man, because you know how yeah. to fish or like yeah. you go play sports and that's you like um, congregating a group and proving that your team is good and bad and it's taught in school and it's healthy. And then like those things, I think got more glamorized through TV and through like all, like you put them and you put anything up in lights and people accept it as being okay. Mm -hmm. You know, like the myth of home ownership. Like that's everyone assumes you can buy a house. You can't buy a house. <laughs> no, you can buy a house. Like, but but every TV show shows like a nuclear family living in like a just four bedroom with two floors somewhere in Middle America. Yeah, uh, you know everything gets normalized basically over I think um, social media and media now at, the, at this point. So why not have gaming become one of those things where it's more right. and more normal? Right? right, you can have the big show playing D and D and in yeah. Big Dick Rick's basement from yeah. <laughs> from Magic Mike, right? Like <laughs> it's it's a different world that we live in than before for sure. Yeah. I mean partially it's uh us getting older and caring less, partially it's social yeah. media, partially it's being on every email list that doesn't let you forget about things that you used to like. But yeah. uh yeah, I have mean, been back in the hobby for seven or eight years now and uh as far as I know I will continue to be for a very long time cool. to come. So yeah. you've come from this purely from like the experiential, you were a customer in the hobby and now you're making content. So we're into the, where you are now, mm -hmm. you started a YouTube channel. What yep. was the catalyst for that? Again, the, the desire to share what I've been working on. Okay. So mentioned before that going to game day, the big point was to show my friends, the models that I had and, sure. and how cool they look together. And you know, as I was getting back into the hobby, there were all kinds of little things that were like, ah, this is neat. I'm proud of this. I want to show this to people. And so, you know, for a while in the back of my mind, it's like someday I'm going to learn how to make a blog post or a Reddit post. Someday I'm going to make a mm -hmm. tutorial on this or that. And anyway, it was just the, the desire to share what I've been up to. Same reason people post on Facebook or Instagram sure. or whatever. Um, I enjoyed YouTube. I thought I could do a good job with a YouTube video. Um, you know, I think, I think it might've been watching one of mini X videos where I'm like, all right, I'm going to try to do this. Cool. Um, and of course I, I had no expectations, but I'm like, okay, I'm going to do what I can to try to make this good. I'll get a 4k video camera and I'll try to do test models at least so that the models I paint look kind of good Yeah. and trial and error. But eventually I got there, um, making videos trying at first at least trying to make videos that plugged a niche that weren't there yet like things that i wish i was able to search and find but weren't there yet so the very first video i made was uh testing paint strippers on plastic models and if you type in what do i use to strip paint off of plastic models into google you will get militant answers of all kinds of different things. You'll get detall and bio strip and, sure, and yeah. break fluid, super clean, the green stuff. It's green. almost like whatever the yeah. person who made that video is most like, like best local thing is, is, right. the, is the video right. that they're going to make because that's yeah. what they have access to. They think is the best. Yeah. yeah. Humans have been cleaning things for thousands of years. Sure. There, there are lots of options. For yeah, this. Yeah. Lots of stuff works. And so the, the first video I made was testing out like six common answers. I never did. I never have tested brake fluid though, but yeah. Too I, dangerous. And, and I never will. Way too dangerous. Way too dangerous. <laughs> because yeah. all of this other stuff works fine. Yep. But and you don't need to have something yeah. that's incredibly dangerous and caustic to, yeah. to strip your miniatures. Yeah. yeah. So the, the first video testing out paint strippers and like, you know, all scientific and here's a bunch of different paints and a matrix of different paints versus different paint strippers. And it's kind of like, yeah. Ethanol works, isopropyl alcohol sure. works, super clean works, LA's totally awesome works. Um, just what's available locally to you to, yeah. to, to a wide degree. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, like I said, the video that made the channel really grow was the batch painting goblins video. 
a right, hundred goblins. Yeah, and and at the time, nobody had done that really at the time. Sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, or there were a few videos. There was one about painting like 400 Spartans or something, but it was not very well shot. Yeah, it's not pop and culture were, either. It's it's, yeah. a, it's a historical video, so it's probably yeah. pretty dry. Um, there was another one um, about talking about the process of painting like a hundred orcs, but they didn't really show it. And so like, okay, I am going to make the video about batch painting a large number of goblins. I went through it. I got all the shots. I got the time lapses. I got close in video. I talked about the strategy. Yeah. How um, do you speed up this process of getting a lot of things painted? So that was yeah. your intent though. Is like, let's demystify. You can paint a lot of models yeah. in, in a decent amount of time without having to like break yourself. And a lot of it was to, teach me that stuff too. Like, okay. like a lot of this stuff is questions that I have that are not well answered on the internet or that there are conflicting answers out there sure, yeah. that I want to, to test and figure that stuff out. So, you know, I've done other test videos about is primer really that important? Is varnish really that important? Um, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, when I have a question where the hearth wisdom, the passed down chicken soup. Level. Yeah, whatever, whatever the conventional <laughs> wisdom is yeah. for it, yeah. Yeah, and I, I like to test those things well, out. Well, mythbustery. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Get, get, get an answer for myself. Yeah, 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 yeah. And try yeah. it for yourself and, like, document that process of you working out, like, does this work? What works? What did I find? Here's one man's opinion. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Okay, so that was that was the big one, was this, was this 100 Goblins video. Yes. So then you became very successful, obviously, at the YouTube thing. And that, that really, like, how did that change sort of your perspective on it because it started off as just like i'm just gonna share some videos like this must take up a lot of your time and energy now how's yes. that how, how is that what was that journey like yeah um so i am now a full-time youtuber cool. and there was a point where actually when i started the channel is i was starting to get a little burnt out at, at my current job right and so Part of the reason I was making videos is because I was doing a lot of hobby in my off time as like stress relief. For sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That mundane task yeah. that like lets you defragment the hard drive basically because right. you could focus on something and it, it right. have an accomplishment. Right. And anyway, I, I was figuring eh, it's probably about time for me to move on from my current job anyway and, and to figure out what's next. And um, yeah, I, I decided like, you know what, I actually have something to at least keep me busy so I, I have enough saved for at least a little bit of fun employment time sure. of just, uh, yeah, decompressing, not having a, a nine to five or significantly longer than a nine to five to, mm -hmm. to go to. And so I did that and the channel continued to grow. And uh, I uh, basically stopped calling myself unemployed at one point and started calling myself a YouTuber at one yeah. point. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the the biggest jump on that wasn't resigning from my job. The biggest jump was when I start to answer the question, what do you do for a living with yeah. the word YouTuber? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. It's, uh, it's very hard to explain to people, isn't it? <laughs> surprisingly easy, actually. Okay. So it, it, there's, there's that like bashful instinct okay. of like, of this has never been considered a real job before. I guess that's true. Like, yeah. But like, yeah, at the at the doctor's office, dentist's office, what have you, in the you know typical small talk, oh, what do you do for a living? And I say YouTuber. And actually, these days, yeah, it it, makes it, sense. They 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 understand it, and they're also like excited and start to enjoy the small talk. Uh, sure, on their side yeah. Of things. So, oh, what what do you what do you do? Like, oh, do pe people watch that? People pay for that? Like, uh, and. That that was actually kind of a cool experience of seeing That's that that awesome. is accepted as a as a real profession because the I think the dental hygienist was like most people just say they're an accountant and then I don't have anything <laughs> to respond to that with. Like, yeah. but they're like oh show me show me your Instagram That's like so yeah, cool yeah. That's awesome so then what's what's the goal for now obviously you're making painting videos still mm -hmm. like what's got you excited about being a YouTuber like having turned your hobby into like a, a digital create, like a content creation journey basically at this point. Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. Like, cause that's the hard I, thing for yeah. me. Yeah. yeah. Right? The where, hardest thing for me is, is like this going the 10 year plan, it, not even the 10 year plan, but just like, how do plan. I stay excited about it? Like constantly oh. it, when, when you are projecting out, right. When you're making things, uh -huh. there's two ways I think in my experience that you can approach it. You can react to what's coming to you 
Like you can react to where the industry is going, what's coming out, what's new, what's exciting. If you watch YouTube, I think there's a lot of that out there. Mm -hmm. People basically, the, the industry is doing one thing and their industry becomes either commentating or participating or creating something based upon that. And then there's, there's like sort of like parallel like paths, but every time you're making something, you're like, you're like putting energy out of the world. You know what I mean? And like doing that over and over and over and over again yep. can, can start, you can start to like, it's almost like saying a word till it doesn't make sense. Like you're saying a word so many times you're like, what am I even yeah. doing anymore? And you get lost. So I don't know what that looks like for you. Well, well I hear what you're saying uh, with anything that you do. Burnout is a risk and there's presumably a wall waiting for you at some point where you either, you just suddenly rethink, why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. And I, I can tell you with a hundred percent honesty, I am not anywhere close. Well, I don't know mm -hmm. if I'm close to that wall, but I know I have not seen it yet. I haven't even caught a glimmer. I, I would yet. argue that yeah. people who've been doing this for a long time, they've already been over the wall. Maybe. Right. Like they, they didn't, maybe they didn't realize it at the time, but yeah. like to achieve a certain level of this, I think you have to have developed either like a conscious or unconscious strategy to remain enthusiastic and excited and mm. and not just like because i don't think it's necessarily burnout i think it's even the capacity to make something new you have to have ideas come i'm not okay. talking so much more about energy but about like cr creative output like there's got to yeah. be something in you that keeps you going like oh i think that's a good idea or oh i'm gonna get excited about this idea or here's this thing that i really want to make or try like there's a certain amount of like i think it's almost like an engine running it can get out of time as you have to do it over and over and over again. I, I hear you. I yeah. hear you. Yeah. So in what I do, the, the core of Goober Town Hobbies is painting miniatures. Sure, of course, yeah. And so on the very most basic level, there are infinity miniatures out there to paint. Yeah. But, you know, I understand that just today I painted this, today I painted this, today I painted this. There's absolutely a wall waiting somewhere. Yeah, on yeah. Path. Um, yeah. And... I am definitely still at a point where I have more ideas than I can possibly make for videos that are outside the just, you know, today I painted a Moldorf, today I painted a Battle mm, Pig. Gotcha. Um, so painting techniques, um, trying out different glues, different, you know, all, all kinds of stuff, like just, just testing out all yeah. kinds of different things, trying different painting techniques. Um, there are kind of educational videos that I want to make of, of trying to learn and understand something and then share that. Is that more satisfying world. than just painting it, something? It definitely, like, is yes. that thing that fulfill, like yeah. that you feel fulfilled by that? If in, in terms of content production? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Cool. Um, so my, my training is as a chemist. And so one of the things that I can do that other content creators would have to work a lot harder to do is to be able to talk about, materials, material science, yeah. all the goos and goops and glues and stuff. Yeah, work. yeah. And so there's there's a subset of those that I, I do understand well enough to to speak about. You know, some of the way uh, you know the way super glue works, for example. Like I know enough about that to be able to share that information yeah. and share the relevant aspects of that information that might affect what you buy and, and how you use it and all that stuff. And because that's a type of video that is difficult for other people to make or you're not getting from other sources, like I think that adds a lot of value. And I think there's uh, definitely appreciation there from the viewers, which makes me feel good, which makes it rewarding. And so that type of video I really like to make. Now, um, in, in the example of I painted a Moldorf archaeologician yep. for to make a video uh, called I painted a Moldorf, Moldorf archaeologician. Yeah, I I thoroughly enjoyed the three, four, five hours I put into painting sure. this model. Okay, and I think I got some crisp looking footage of it, and I want to you know I would like to share that at, at least on Instagram to be like look at this cool thing. I yeah, made. yeah, and uh, you know a few painting tips. But the the reward from publishing that video is not as much as sharing something new or that's something that people haven't seen before or haven't understood in that way before. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm still at a point where I have a lot of ideas of videos I want to make that are beyond just uh, I painted a battle pig or whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I'm, I, I think that's really interesting because it's like, 
it, it, it sounds almost like the process of making it, like the process of painting miniatures for anyone who loves painting miniatures is always going to be rewarding in so much as you got to relax while you made content. You get to do yes. something you fit, yes. you actually like enjoy yes. while you're doing it. But then like that, that like exploration, that like mental exercise, it sounds like where you're teaching a skill, you're answering a question. Mm -hmm. you, the process might be more complicated and have more moving parts and stuff, but then the product at the end of it almost is more fulfilling because you've made right. something that you feel like has value. You know right. what I mean? Like, and right. it's going to stand on its own and it's going to be more evergreen and it's going to like sit and be yeah. important for a minute. I can definitely relate yeah. to that. For for me, it's, um, it's, I think why I get such a pleasure out of doing indie games is I like the cooking and the preparation part of like assembling just the right terrain and getting the yeah. miniatures all painted and doing something unique where like I, no one's ever done it this way before and I'm the one doing it. And then that satisfying uh, satisfaction isn't even like the recording of the videos. It's the moment right before I start making the videos where it's all in front of me and it's just the way I imagined it. Nice. And like that, that's I think why I keep coming back to that because mainstream games, especially today, a lot of it you don't make a lot of it yourself. It's kind of done for you. The train is plastic and built mm. one way. Um, it looks like their universe. It's made like I, I even like to like the Marvel games where every piece of trains branded to something in the Marvel universe that doesn't even get their cut, like the mouse needs to get their money. So like mm -hmm. you, you have to have like a, you know, um, uh, what is it? A, um, a daily planet logo on it, or it's never going to be something that I'm going to be as excited about as a piece of train I made myself. And so the sad, the satisfaction, I think of the laying it all, it's still there, but it's not the same as if I like, I, I got to extrovert like my own imagination onto the table. So I can understand that feeling of fulfillment where like you've made something that's like no one ever, no one else has ever tested these four chemicals and no one else could. Cause yeah. they don't, they're not a chemist. They're not me. They can't speak about it like this when it's all said and done. Right. And so it was 10 times more work doing it. It wasn't, it was tangentially hobby related. It was more like how the sausage gets made but when it's yeah. done you sit back and you look at it and you're like yeah I yes did that. that's cool yeah that's awesome and so there's enough variety of that kind of related to the hobby but not just plugging along so that i think i'm gonna i think i'm gonna stay interested and yeah, excited for, sure. for a long time and i i should say that as time goes on i realize that i really really enjoy the like the process of painting I enjoy being at my painting desk, moving the paint around. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a, a core level of enjoyment for me. Um, again, there's probably only so many videos you can make that are just overhead shots of painting. Um, sure. I, I suspect that if I was only making that, I would hit a wall in terms of the content production yeah. of that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, but for now, enjoying it and uh just feel lucky that it can be a career path cool is there, anything you've, is there any type of video you've never made you would like to make is there anything like you haven't done like style wise or content wise that's like related to this because you did some stuff that a lot of content creators don't do like you did you did capture a footage on a canoe man like that's not oh yeah that's not you know what i mean like you did some stuff that was very <laughs> interesting to me because it like it displayed you a lot of content creators it's like there, there's a there's an element I think creeping in across all content being made on YouTube of this like people kind of they have like their I don't know it's almost like a you get dressed up for it it's almost like a, a content creator cosplay where people are kind of like dressed for content creation so mm -hmm. they they look like they're going to the club a little, a little bit right you went and got in a canoe and it gave you this aura of like I don't know it was like relatability where it's just I'm gonna talk about something I like doing while I'm doing something I like doing you know yep. what I mean like I've I'd never seen that before in anything so yeah. I'm just curious about how that came about and like if you're ever gonna do anything <laughs> different like that again well i've tried the canoe a couple of times yeah and uh i haven't quite made back i definitely have not made back the money i spent videos? on gopros yeah, yeah i was gonna say <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh yeah that was I, again i i like to be outside i like paddling sure, around yeah. um i thought it was visually very cool especially when i did get a, a gopro yeah it turned out really well the the first time i tried it i just took my my camera that I use for YouTube, I put it on a tripod. I balanced a tripod in the front seat of the canoe. Whoa, you gambled yeah. big on that one. Yeah. 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 Well, maybe I'll lose $400. Maybe I won't, <laughs> yeah, but I haven't right, flipped yeah. my canoe over yet. So that's true. Yeah. 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 It's pretty safe for sure. <laughs> um, but anyway, the, I tried that out and it, well, yeah, it was a weird risk to put your camera in a canoe, but I got back and I looked at the footage. It's like, it just looks really cool. It's like, very cool. Yeah. Uh, I, I understand how, you know, 
nature camping style videos do it now because like the footage looks awesome mm -hmm. um and it's like an ex it's more it's experiential yeah like you're getting to experience something per associate with somebody while they're doing something that people don't do in their day-to-day -day lives so i think there's yeah. an element of that too yeah. um yeah, it's just interesting that that was something you blended into. I've I've been trying YouTube videos. So the the last two times I've been in a canoe, yeah. I I done two of these videos now. Going fishing with space marines. You take a space marine, paint it, paint a space marine. Okay. You drill a hole through it, put a wire rod through it, a barrel swivel on one end, sure. tre or treble hook on the other, and I caught a lot of bass. Like I caught wow. a, I caught a lot of bass with space marines. What chapter? Uh, well, that was that was the point of the it was, video. Oh, it was it what was chapter like, catches like, the most yeah, yeah. fish? Oh, wow. Yeah, um, no, <laughs> no surprise. Imperial fist did very well. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. high vis, high vis. Uh, I was kind of surprised my my ultramarine did pretty well. Also, huh. it was maybe a little bit lighter blue than, than sure. some people use. But uh, what I already did? I did a chaos one, like kind of color shift chaos -y one. I did. <laughs> the dark angels on on that fishing trip i painted up a dark angels miniature and then i have footage from two different camera angles of me tying the knot i go to cast the dark angel miniature and the knot just breaks in midair it's oh like, no and it just goes to infinity <laughs> that's but, amazing but that was the best part of the video yeah because i uh i was able to keep my cool or at least my natural response was to just burst out laughing <laughs> in, instead of like, <laughs> it, instead of like start swearing that like yeah yeah now these were not four hour paint jobs these were like sure half yeah, an yeah, hour yeah, yeah. Paint jobs. these are going like, underwater get, we're not we're not going to yeah, care about get these. some they're green gonna, on there get some brief dynamic there. lives yeah. are for content creation yeah. and that's it yeah <laughs> but yeah i caught caught a lot of fish with that's those. incredible now the YouTube metrics are not pushing the miniature painting fishing crossover. No, you definitely, no. yeah, you're definitely yeah. making something where it's it's shortened out a little bit. It's like, what is this guy trying to do? <laughs> For sure, but it's different. I mean, it definitely yeah. makes you stand out. I think as far as content creators go, that. You've tried some things that I don't think I've ever seen anybody right. else try. Yeah. Apart from like lighting all your miniatures on fire on a piece of wood, like that's a that's a that will that will go do down that. in history. I can't do it. Like that's. I mean, it's a great idea for a video, but it's, I can't do it. I can't do it. <laughs> Physically yeah. incapable. Yeah. Physically yeah. incapable. Yeah. Like my, my hand would like <laughs> yeah, you just, you just skits out and not be able to do it for sure. Yeah. Uh, I'd be like, <laughs> yeah, your program in, in grand programming would, would kick in. You wouldn't be able to do it. I can't hurt these. <laughs> that was, um, that, I was like that with minister, miniature transport. I had to take care of them. Uh, my, uh, my, one of my collaborators, Owen, who used to be in the studio all the time, he would just put stuff in a box and throw it in the back of his car like man just like grinding against each other rolling around and every time we'd go anywhere together in his car i get in the car look in the back seat and be like man if there was a child services for miniatures i'd be calling them right now like this is inappropriate you shouldn't be doing this and i think he got more aggressive with them the longer the more times i said that basically just to like prove me wrong mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well that's exciting man i'm i'm excited to see what you come up with next honestly i i don't watch a lot of youtube i've talked about that pretty openly like but your stuff in particular uh, I was excited to meet you at uh, Depticon because I'd actually yeah. seen your videos and I thought they were really cool and they were challenging and they did something I hadn't seen before, which was, it wasn't just commenting about either business practices or, you know, another paint, how to paint blue or something like that. It was actually yeah. like informative and I do those sometimes too, but not as much. Well, but, yeah. but the thought yeah. that the things that caught my eye were these like experiments that you did and especially your stuff where you were, um, where you were trying, where you were myth busting basically, or you were doing yeah. something that was like constructive and, and really like, I think, I think, uh, probably an expression of how your brain works because your personality is definitely like having not met you, you you come across as the guy who asks himself those questions all the time and then answers them on camera and makes these cool videos so it was very yeah. cool so we're gonna play a game we're gonna play some rock blade nice yeah um, good to so me. so uh you've just started playing rock blade sean's uh got you some miniatures yeah. you painted up some of the moldorf expedition you're showing off right there yeah so i've played a total of one game with uh fiverr from sugar candy miniatures sweet. shout out but sweet uh i've been painting them off and on slowly for a couple of years uh sean sutter did send me a a healthy sample bundle to oh, get me he's going such a sweet guy he is he is thanks sean um but it stuck it it, it stuck in a way that um i don't know 90 percent of games don't and mm -hmm. it's just for whatever reason it it hit me just right and obviously the the art style is is beautiful but i also love the idea that 
it's one person doing the 3D sculpts, doing the 2D art, yeah. writing the rules, drawing the diagrams in the rule book. And so it's all very cohesive. It's all clearly uh, a, a passion project, a work of love. And I mean, man, he's still signing all of the rule books he, he sells. And my rule book has a uh, Teclan Elder Ford, the uh, gnome grenadier in yep. it. And I don't have him here with me, but I've, I've got the painted miniature. It's just so cool to see the, the little sketch that the game designer did in my rule book compared to the miniature that he sculpted, compared to the art on the game card. Yeah. And it's, it's all from the same person, and I get to take part in it by painting the miniatures. And uh, we, we didn't get too much of this. I don't actually play many games. It's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's very rare that I play a game. Um, for I me, think that's true of a lot of people. Yeah, a lot more people than people. Yeah. A lot more people than the discourse about miniature wargaming online. Mm-hmm. I think right. represents it, it. Is it is is that that's true for them? They play yeah. maybe two or three times a year, yep. and the and eighty percent of their time is thinking about collecting, building, painting their their hobby. And that's yep. that's why that's why it's not a game so much as it's a hobby in, in a lot of, I think the discourse, yep. because that's a hobby is something you use your spare minutes on, right? Like it's not something that you do right. all the time constantly. And the measure of it necessarily isn't the value of the f- final act of like playing a game. The measure is the quality of the time you spent doing the whole process. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, I've slowly come to the realization that the, the, the game, for me is a framework of here is a crew of minis to paint in the same fashion right or here's a way to to organize a a list or a team or whatever and it's yeah it's it's the excuse it's the framework for me to do the collecting and scheming and painting and uh i i tell myself yeah i'm doing all this for the day that i eventually play this game which sometimes that day comes around and sometimes it doesn't but if you are up for a game of Relic Blade, let's let's give it a shot. I yeah, read, for sure. I read the rule book. It looks good. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a, well, I think I think that's important as like a it, people need a logical endpoint for their activity. Yeah. And the game is like a logical endpoint, but the game isn't the point of the activity. The activity is the point of the activity, right? right. And Sean, I think, is so unique in this in the landscape of this industry because his his thing that he makes his game Relic Blade. It's not a game, it's art. He makes art, and the way that he makes art is that he produces this game. Mm-hmm. And all of the parts of it are something he made. So it's like an artist or a chef, right? The restaurant that the chef has, the whole thing is an expression of what he wants to do to make you dinner, right? The same thing with Relic Blade. This is his whole restaurant. He made all the pieces because he wants to express himself by making this thing, and that really does come across. And I think that's why he's, I don't want to speak for him, but he's the sweetest man in Wargaming, and I think that's why he cares so much about signing everything individually is it's he cares about that thing that he made and it's it's an expression of him right that whole thing that you're consuming he wants every meal to be the best he can make it so he goes in above and beyond i think to make that special for everybody it shows it shows and and like i said i i see a lot of sample minis i paint minis from a ton of different companies sure. but for whatever reason relic blade stuck in my mind and now i've been back in the kickstarters and buying stuff every time i sure. go to a convention and uh yeah let's let's give it a shot let's give it a shot for sure so before we go do you have anything you want to plug anything that you're excited about anything you're working on that you got you got right now that people should go check out oh type goober town hobbies into you into well definitely youtube type, into the youtube type yeah. goober town hobbies into your computer and see what happens uh, see what yeah. happens that's what you're excited yeah. about all right cool all right well thanks for coming in man and chatting and we'll see you guys later it's a pleasure